Don't you think it's a little bit strange that Ronald Reagan had an operation on his asshole and George Bush had an operation on his middle finger, huh? <laughs> still do not understand why it is that most of the people who are against abortion are people you wouldn't want to fuck in the first place. <laughs> Boy, those conservatives are really something, aren't they? They're all in favor of the unborn, but once you're born, you're on your fucking own. God help you, if you actually need something from one of those people, they'll shoot you in the asshole and take your beer money away. <laughs> I don't see many of those white Christian anti-abortion women volunteering to have any black fetuses transplanted into their uteruses, do you? No, that might be the Christian thing to do. I'm not going to sit around and wait for that to come over the news. Anyway, uh, thanks for coming here and uh, helping to support this uh, drive or cause, you know, to, uh, to save the bitter end. Uh, my own uh, memory and my own history with the bitter end are, uh, are, are fairly simple and they go back quite a, quite a number of years. Uh, this is the first uh, club where my mother ever heard me say cocksucker in public. <laughs> it's true. She was sitting on her inside wall and she had heard me say it at home a lot of times. But that was being paid for it and that was one of the wonders she took to the grave. But, uh, actually paying them for saying that shit. But I, uh, back in 1962, which is 30 years ago, for those of you that aren't really fast, uh, I broke up with a partner I had in comedy, Jack Burns. We were Burns and Carlin at the time, and Jack later became much better known <laughs> when he found a different partner, namely Avery Schreiber, and Burns and Schreiber made a little, uh, noise for themselves, but after Jack and I broke up, I, I started uh, working as a single, and one of the things I did in, uh, in 1963 was to decide to sort of take a stand in, in New York and find a place uh, where I could uh, work out a kind of gymnasium, I, I mean, I'm talking about comedy now, not the, not the working out of today's uh, era, but, uh, you know, work on things and, and have a laboratory, a place to do stuff. So I came here, I came, I went to the, uh, cat, I'll just tell you this quickly and I'll start doing my shit. Um, <laughs> I went to, they used to have hootenannies in those days. A lot of you know about hootenannies. Hootenannies were like open mic night, but it was the folk era and it was mostly guitar players and shit and a few, few comedians would be in there. And I did one at the Cafe Wa on Monday and I came here on Tuesday and I went to Cafe Wa the next Monday and I came here the next Tuesday and the guy across the street, okay, Howie Solomon from uh, the Cafe or Go Go, uh, noticed me and I got to work there for about two years on and off different uh, salaries, some nights for a hamburger, some nights for $35, and that was the place where everything happened to me. So this has a direct line, direct history for me, and that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm involved, and the other is because I think it's, it's just important that places like these uh, stay alive. Now, okay. And as these events continue with different people like Chris Christopherson or whoever comes in, Joan Baez, whatever, please uh, tell other people and, and get them interested if you can. Uh, I'd like to start by telling you a regular, ordinary, everyday garden variety, run of the mill, you heard one, you heard them all, joke. The kind of joke millions of people tell millions of people every other day and something you can tell somebody tomorrow if you pay attention. Two old guys in the nursing home. It takes place in the nursing home. Two old guys, Mo and Joe. Mo and Joe, and what they do all day for amusement of the nursing home is to sit in the lobby of the nursing home over against one wall and watch the action, watch the people coming and going inside the nursing home, doctors and nurses and technicians and visitors and new people and people going in and coming out, and that's all they do. They just sit there. They don't say a whole lot. Maybe you might hear a little bit of... <laughs> That's about it from Mo and Joe. Now, there's one old woman who lives in the nursing home who has a lot of different clothing. Have you ever noticed that, by the way, that old people have kind of fucked up clothing? <laughs> you know, they haven't bought anything for about 30 years, and they have three waves of shit that's out of style, and they mix things bizarrely. That's the oddest part of it. They mix in a, in a very unusual way. You'll see sometimes a guy with a, a brown hat and a green shirt, red tie, blue jacket, orange pants, check. 
fragrant sneakers. I call it cancer of the clothing. So there's this one old woman, as I say, and every morning she puts on a different one of these outfits, because she has so much clothing, and puts on a different outfit every morning, and walks through the lobby of the nursing home, just parades up and down in front of Mo and Joe, hoping for a nice word, just looking for a compliment, some small little word to make her feel good in one of these outfits. Nothing, nothing, not a word from these guys. Maybe she might get a little bit of... Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's not all she hears, and she gets fed up with it one morning and says to her friend, that's it, that's it, I'm sick of it, tomorrow, naked, tomorrow I'm taking off all of my clothes and going through the lobby, that'll get their attention, sure enough, next morning, right after breakfast, goes to her room, takes off everything absolutely naked, just walks right through the lobby, up and down several times in front of Mo and Joe. One of them says to the other, what she got on this time? He says, I don't know, but it sure needs ironing. <laughs> Just a small joke to get us started. <laughs> One of the areas of comedy I've had a lot of fun with, and, and most comedians uh, fool with it from time to time, those little things that we all know about, those little universal moments in our lives, the things that happen to all of us over and over and over that don't amount to much. We all know them. These are the things, I think, that make us all the same, you know? Because there's enough shit floating around to make you feel different from everybody else in this country. That's all you ever hear about in this country is our differences. The, 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 the media and the politicians, all they ever want to talk about is those things that keep us separate from one another because, of course, they work for the ruling class and it's in the interest of the ruling class to divide the rest of the people. Keep the lower and the middle classes fighting with each other so that they, the rich, can run off with all the fucking money. <laughs> Fairly simple idea. Fairly simple idea. And, of course, it happens to work beautifully for them. Anything that's different about us, you know that's all you're going to hear about. Talk about racial differences, religious differences, ethnic and national backgrounds, jobs, income, education, social status, sexuality, anything they can do to keep us fighting with each other so that they can keep going to the bank. You know, I describe the social classes, the economic classes in this country. The upper class keeps all of the money, pays none of the taxes. The middle class pays all of the taxes, does all of the work. The poor are there just to scare the shit out of the middle class. <laughs> keep them showing up at those jobs on time. <laughs> so, in the midst of stirring up the shit myself a little bit, which I enjoy, I also like knowing I can come back to these little things, these little moments we all inhabit. Little things that don't amount to much, you know. Did you ever look at your watch? And then you don't know what time it is. <laughs> and you have to look again. And you still don't know the time. So you look a third time. Somebody says, what time is it? You say, I don't know. <laughs> Did you ever notice how sometimes all day Wednesday, you keep thinking it's Thursday. And it happens over and over all day long. And then the next day, you're all right again. <laughs> Did you ever find yourself standing in one of the rooms in your house and you can't remember why you went in there? <laughs> and you think, maybe if I go back where I was when I first thought of it, I'll see something that reminds me of it. Or it might be quicker if I just stand here and hope it comes back to me. <laughs> While you're weighing that up in your mind, two words float across your consciousness. Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> Little moments we've all had. Ever been sitting in a railroad train in the station, and there's another train sitting right next to you, and one of them starts to move, and you can't tell which one it is? How about looking through a chain link fence? Do you ever notice sometimes if you're just the right distance from a chain link fence, it seems to go, how do they do that? What is 
to that. Do you ever try to tell somebody they have a little bit of dirt on their face? You can never get them to rub the right spot. Say so you got a little bit of dirt right here. They always go, where? Here? Yeah. You just want to slap the bastard. You know? Say so no, right here near your eye. <laughs> Do you ever notice how awful your face looks in a mirror in a restroom that has fluorescent lights? Every cut, scrape, scratch, scar, scab, bruise, boil, bump, pimple, zip, wart, welt, and abscess you've had since birth all seem to come back at the same time. And all you can think of is, I gotta get the fuck out of here before they think I really look like this. This is not my real face. Do you ever notice sometimes when you're walking with your arm around your date, one of you has to change the way you're walking? Men and women don't walk the same. One of them has to change. Either the man has to walk like this, or the woman has to walk like this. How about when you're going up a flight of stairs and you think there's one more step? And you go, Ugh. Then you have to kind of keep doing that, you know? So the other people will think it's something you do all the time. I do this all the time. It's the third stage of syphilis. <laughs> When you drink grapefruit juice in the morning, do you go, <laughs> I do too. Why do we drink it? It's like ice cream throat. You know when you've eaten ice cream too fast and you get that frozen spot on the back of your throat but there's nothing you can do about it because you can't reach it to rub it. You just have to kind of wait for it to go away. And it does. Then what do you do? Eat more ice cream. What are we, fucking stupid? Do you ever fall asleep in the late afternoon and wake up after dark and you don't know what goddamn day it is? And you think, maybe it's yesterday. How about when you're lying with your head on the pillow? Do you ever notice when you have your head on the pillow, if you close the bottom eye, the pillow is down there. And if you switch eyes, the pillow moves up there. Moving some of these times, some of these moments I'm talking about can be embarrassing. <laughs> you ever been in a serious social situation, some serious moment, and you suddenly realize you have to pull the underwear out of the crack in your ass? <laughs> Take this woman to be your lawful wife. <laughs> huh? To her? Oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> Life's little moments. <laughs> you ever been at a really noisy party? You know the kind of party, I mean, really loud music, everyone talking too loudly. And in order to be heard, even by the person standing next to you, you've got to be screaming at the top of your lungs. But every now and then at a party, it seems as though everyone shuts up at the same time. And only your voice can be heard ringing across the room. Right, right, I know, I know. Well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to have my testicles laminated. Nice little moments. You ever been talking to someone and you laugh through your nose and blow a snot on your shirt? And you have to just kind of keep talking, you know? You make believe it's part of the design. Works all right if you're wearing a Hawaiian shirt. Otherwise, they're going to know. Yeah. Big snot. 
And not all the time is you're embarrassed, you know, it's not always your fault. It's not always your fault when you're thoroughly and publicly humiliated. A lot of times it's a situation you've walked into and you become the victim. Not your fault. I'll give you an example, kind of thing I mean, where you're the one left hanging out, had nothing to do with you. Did you ever meet somebody and you go to shake the guy's hand and you suddenly realize he doesn't have a complete hand? <laughs> you know the feeling? There's a big knob there, there's no thumb coming over the top, something is wrong, a finger is missing, this guy has a fucked up hand and it's not your fault. But you got to make believe it feels great. Am I right? You can't go, ah! 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 You can't do that. It's not even an option. You've got to hang in there and say, hi. Hey, swell hand. Give me three. your fault. You didn't cause that. You weren't even there when it happened to the guy. But you're the one who has the burden. <laughs> Give you another example of the same kind of thing, just to put a finer point on it. Same kind of thing. Not your fault. But this one happens a lot more often in real life. You'll recognize this one. Give ever meet somebody and the first thing you notice, first thing you notice, <laughs> is that both of his eyes in the same place, at the same time. Eventually, they'll see the same things, of course, by chance. But they'll see them on different schedules. A man has independently targeted eyes. Not your fault. Eh? You didn't cause that. You didn't sneak up behind the guy five years ago and hit him in the head with a big piece of wood. But you're the one who has all the pressure. You're the one who has all the responsibility. Because you're the one who has to decide which eye to look at. And you don't want to hurt the guy's feelings. You don't want to hurt the person's feelings, am I right? Last thing you want to do, hurt the guy's feelings. In fact, I try to save their feelings. I do everything twice, once for each eye. <laughs> But they really don't care for that shit at all. <laughs> and after a while, after a while, you begin to notice, begin to notice that one of the eyes has locked onto you. <laughs> and you gain confidence. And you think to yourself, okay, that's the one I'm going to go with. <laughs> and as you bear down and concentrate on that single eye, you begin to realize that for 15 minutes, he's been describing a big tree over there. <laughs> Not your fault. You didn't cause that. You weren't even there when it happened to the guy. You were probably off somewhere making an important decision. Should this belch be audible? <laughs> Every time we belch, each of us, we have an option. Just before belching, there is an option. Should this belch be audible? Or should I keep this one to myself and sneak it past the game? You know how to do that, I know. You've done it hundreds of thousands of times. The secret silent belch. You open your throat to its roundest configuration. 
thereby allowing the column of foul air to escape. It sounds like this. <laughs> And it's at a moment like that, at a moment like that, that you can taste a Greek wedding dinner you had four years ago. Quite a bargain, the Greek wedding dinner. Still paying off 48 months later. There are, in the English language, certain little phrases that we use all the time, all of us, and we just take them for granted. We don't really think about them very much, look at them carefully, and realize what it is we're seeing. We just sort of, like I say, take them for granted, like legally drunk. <laughs> well, if it's legal, what's the fucking problem? Leave the guy alone, he's fucking legally drunk. <laughs> you know where you can stick it. How often do you hear that? You know where you can stick that. Well, why do we always assume everyone knows where they can stick it? Suppose you don't know. Suppose you're a new guy. You have absolutely no idea where to stick it. I think there ought to be a government booklet entitled Where to Stick It. <laughs> now that I think of it, I believe there is a government booklet. <laughs> they send it to you when you complain about your income tax. <laughs> selling like hotcakes. Well, is this the fastest selling item we could think of? For this expression? Coffee, cigarettes, beer, for Christ's sakes. Even eggs. You go to the average place where people are ordering breakfast, you're going to hear a lot more guys ordering eggs than are ordering hotcakes. But it doesn't sound good, does it? Michael Jackson's new album is selling like eggs. <laughs> Lacks a certain ring. Undisputed heavyweight champion. Well, if it's undisputed, what's all the fighting about? <laughs> to me, undisputed means we all agree on something. These two guys are beating the shit out of one another. Over something apparently we all agree on. I got, I got notes on this if you don't mind. Oh, here's it, here's it. But it's the quiet ones you gotta watch. Yeah? Every time, it seems like every time I'm watching a nice story on TV about a serial murderer, some sort of a mass killing, which I enjoy personally. <laughs> I'm watching and enjoying some guy on the TV will say, well, he was very quiet. And someone in the room will say, it's the quiet one you gotta watch. This sounds to me like a very dangerous assumption. I'll bet you anything that while you're watching a quiet one, a noisy one will fucking kill you. <laughs> Suppose you're in a bar and one guy's sitting over in a corner reading a book, not bothering anybody. The other guy's got a machete, he's banging it on the bar saying, I'll kill the first motherfucker who comes in here. <laughs> who are you gonna watch? <laughs> Goddamn right. <laughs> That's the last straw. That doesn't seem fair to me, you know? I think you ought to give a guy a warning. That's the next to the last straw. Let him know he's running out of straws. <laughs> down the pike. Oh, he was the meanest guy ever come down the pike. What about guys who come up the pike? Not everybody lives north of the pike. A lot of guys come up the pike, and they're really mean because nobody talks about them at all. What about guys who don't even use the pike? The guy comes on Amtrak. He was the meanest guy ever to arrive on Amtrak. It's like eggs, you know, it doesn't have that ring. Doesn't have that ring. Down the twos. You hear this one a lot the last couple of years, especially. Boy, the country is going down the tubes. What tubes? Have you seen any tubes? Where are these tubes? And where do they go? And how come there's more than one two? Would seem to me one country, one two. What, does every state all of a sudden have to have its own two? 
thought your name's one too. For the truth that big, somebody would have seen it by now. <laughs> somebody would have said, hey, Joey, look at the fucking dude. <laughs> sliced bread. Yeah. Greatest thing since sliced bread. Is this the greatest thing we could think of? For this expression, sliced bread? The pyramids, for Christ's sake. Air conditioning, wristwatch, contact lenses, even a lava lamp. <laughs> to me, is greater than sliced bread. What's so great about sliced bread? You got a knife, you got a loaf of bread, slice the fucking thing. Now let me get on with my life. <laughs> takes the cake. He really takes the cake. Hear that, Lefty? Oh, that guy really takes the cake. Where? Where do you take a cake? To the movies? You know where I would take a cake? Down to the bakery to visit the other cakes. <laughs> and how come he takes the cake? How come he don't take the pie? Pie is easier to carry than a cake. Easiest pie. Cake is not too hard to carry either. Piece of cake. <laughs> lock him up and throw away the key. You hear people say that a lot. Hey, I'll take that guy, lock him up and throw away the key. Well, first of all, every time this guy's got to take a shit, you're going to have to call a locksmith. If he's doing 30 years, even if he's eating government cheese, he's going to be, you know, what a fucking fortune. And where do you throw the key? Where do you throw it? Right in front of the jail. His friends will look for him. The guy will be out of there in no time. How, how far can you throw a key? Watch, 50, 60 feet down. Even if you scale it on its side like that flat. Maybe an extra 10 feet, that's all you're going to hear. This is a completely stupid thing. It has to be completely rethought. Fine and dandy. <laughs> Old guys say that. How are you? Fine and dandy. Not me. I never say that. You know why? I've never been both of those things at the same time. Sometimes I'm fine. Not dandy. Close to dandy. Approaching dandy. In the vicinity of dandy. Not quite dandy. Other times, rarely, I grant you, but occasionally, I'm dandy. Really dandy. Quintessentially dandy. Not fine. One time, 1965, August, for about an hour, I was both fine and dandy at the same time. Nobody asked me how I was. I could have told them, fine and dandy. I consider it a lost opportunity. How walking the streets, you hear that? Some guy gets out of jail and murder, gets out too early, you know, guy gets parole. Instead of being in prison, they say, nah, instead of being in prison, this guy's out walking the streets. How do we know? Maybe he's all watching TV. <laughs> Not everybody on parole gets, you know, is walking the fucking streets. Sometimes they take the bus. Some guys steal a car. We should be glad of that. Thank God he stole a car. Otherwise, he might be out walking the streets. <laughs> More than happy. People say, oh, I'd be more than happy to do it. How can you be more than happy? To me, it sounds like a dangerous mental condition. <laughs> we had to put Dave in the mental home. He was more than happy. <laughs> from a job? Did you ever get walking papers? Yeah? I've been fired from a lot of jobs in my life. I really mean it. I never got walking papers. Never got a pink slip either. Know what I would get? Some guy would come to my desk and say, get the fuck out of here! <laughs> what would walking papers say? Take a walk, brother. You know? Take a fucking walk. I can't figure it out. All right, last one of these. In your own words. Did you say that to you? Tell us in your own words. <laughs> Do you have your own words? I'm using the ones everybody else is using. <laughs> Next time somebody tells you to say something in your own words, say, Nick Flock, Barney, Quanto, Flee!
leads me to flying on the airlines. <laughs> flying on the airlines and listening, all of us, to the airlines' announcements <laughs> and trying to pretend to ourselves that the language they're using is really English. Doesn't sound like it to me. There's an awful lot of bureaucrat talk in that airline announcement language. And I'm not looking for perfect English. Just sensible language. And you don't find much of it on the airline. whole thing starts when you get to the gate. By the way, did you ever notice there is no gate at the gate? There's no gate at the gate. It's a bullshit word left over from railroad days. Anyway, when you get to the gate, you'll hear the first announcement. We would like to begin the boarding process. That's your word, process. Not necessary. Boarding is enough. We'd like to begin the boarding. Simple. It tells the story. People add extra words when they want things to sound more important than they really are. Boarding process. Sounds important. It isn't. Just a bunch of people getting on an airplane. People like to sound important. Weathermen on television talk about shower activity. It sounds more important than showers, doesn't it? I even heard one guy on CNN refer to a rain event. I swear to God. So Louisiana's expecting a rain event. I thought, holy shit, I hope I can get tickets to that. <laughs> emergency situation. News people on television like to say, police have responded to an emergency situation. No, they haven't. They've responded to an emergency. We know it's a situation. <laughs> Everything is a situation. Anyway, as part of this boarding process, they say, we would like to pre-board. But well, what exactly is that? What does it mean to pre-board? You get on before you get on? That's another complaint of mine. Too much use of this prefix pre. It's all over the language now. Pre this, pre that. Place the turkey in a preheated oven. It's ridiculous. There are only two states an oven can possibly exist in, heated or unheated. Preheated is a meaningless fucking term. And completely without merit, it's like pre-recorded. This program was pre-recorded. Well, of course it was pre-recorded. What else are you going to record it afterwards? That's the whole principle of recording, to do it beforehand. Otherwise, it doesn't really work, does it? Pre-existing, pre-planning, pre-screening. You know what I tell these people? Pre-suck my genital situation. And they seem to understand what I'm talking about. So anyway, as part of this pre-boarding, they say, we would like to pre-board those passengers traveling with small children. Well, what about those passengers traveling with large children? <laughs> Suppose you have a two-year-old with a pituitary disorder. <laughs> you know, a six-foot infant with an oversized head. <laughs> kind of kid you see in the National Enquirer all the time. <laughs> Actually, with a kid like that, I think you're better off checking him right in with your luggage to curb, don't you? <laughs> well, they like it under there. It's dark. They're used to that. <laughs> About this time, someone is telling you to get on the plane. Get on the plane, get on the plane. I say, fuck you, I'm getting in the plane. <laughs> Let evil Knievel get on the plane. <laughs> I'll be in here with you folks in uniform. <laughs> there seems to be less wind in here. <laughs> they might tell you you're that your flight is a non-stop flight. <laughs> well, I don't think I care for that. No, I insist that my flight stop. Preferably at an airport. It's those sudden unscheduled cornfield and housing development stops that seem to interrupt the flow of my day. Here's one they just made up. Near miss. When two planes almost collide, they call it a near miss. It's a near hit. A collision is a near miss. <laughs> Look, they nearly missed. Yes, but not quite. They might tell you your flight has been delayed because of a change of equipment. Broken plane. <laughs> what they really mean is we're looking around for a plane that isn't broken. <laughs> tell me to put my seat back forward. <laughs> Why don't Ben 
that way. If I could put my seat back forward, I'd be in porno movies. <laughs> then they mentioned carry-on luggage. First time I heard carry-on, I thought they were going to bring a dead deer on board. I thought, what the hell did they mean with that? I don't have the little TV dinners anymore. Then I thought, carry on, carry on, there's going to be a party. People are going to be carrying on on the plane. Well, I don't care for that. I like a serious attitude on the plane, especially on the flight deck, which is the latest euphemism for cockpit. <laughs> Can't imagine why they wouldn't want to use a lovely word like cockpit, can you? Especially with all those stewardesses going in and out of it all the time. There's a word that's changed, stewardess. First it was hostess, then stewardess, now it's flight attendant. You know what I call her? The lady on the plane. <laughs> Sometimes it's a man on the plane. Now, that's good equality. I'm all in favor of that. Occasionally, they actually refer to these people as uniformed crew members. Did you hear that? They'll say, if you have any questions about the safety equipment, please ask a uniformed crew member. Oh. <laughs> uniform. As opposed to this guy sitting next to me here in a Grateful Dead t-shirt and a fuck you hat. <laughs> Who's working on his ninth little bottle of Kahlua on my neck. <laughs> Speaking of safety, as soon as they close the door to the aircraft, that's when they begin the safety lecture. I love the safety lecture. This is my favorite part of the plane ride. I listen very carefully to the safety lecture, especially that part where they teach us how to use the seat belts. Imagine this. Here we are, a plane full of grown human beings, many of us partially educated, and they're actually taking time out to describe the intricate workings of a belt buckle. Place the small metal flap into the buckle. Well, I asked for clarification of that. <laughs> Pardon me over here, please. Yes, thank you very much. Did I hear you correctly? Did you say place the small metal flap into the buckle or place the buckle over and around the small metal flap? I'm a simple man. I do not possess an engineering degree, nor am I mechanically inclined. I'm sorry to have taken up so much of your time. Please continue with the wonderful safety lecture. <laughs> Seatbelts. High-tech shit. The next thing they do, they tell you to locate your nearest emergency exit. I do this immediately. <laughs> my nearest emergency exit, and then I plan my route. You have to plan your route. It's not always a straight line, is it? Sometimes there's a really big fat fox sitting right in front of me. <laughs> and you know you'll never get over him. I look around for women and children, midgets and dwarfs, cripples, poor widows, paralyzed veterans, people with broken legs, anyone who looks like they can't move too well. The emotionally disturbed come in very handy at a time like this. In fact, you might have to well, go out of your way to find these people, but believe me, you'll get out of the plane a lot goddamn quicker. I said, let's see. I'll go around the fat fuck, step on the widow's head, push those children out of the way, knock down the paralyzed midget, and get out of the plane where I can help others. no help to anyone if I'm lying unconscious in the aisle with some big cocksucker standing on my neck. I must get out of the plane, go to a nearby farmhouse, have a Dr. Pepper, and call the police. <laughs> the safety lecture continues. <laughs> in the unlikely event, this is a very suspect phrase, especially coming as it does from an industry that is willing to lie about arrival and departure times. In the unlikely event of a sudden change in cabin pressure, roof flies off. An 
oxygen mask will drop down in front of you. Place the mask over your face and breathe normally. <laughs> well, I have no problem with that. I always breathe normally when I'm in a 600 mile an hour uncontrolled vertical dive. I also shit normally. <laughs> right in my pants! <laughs> they tell you to adjust your oxygen mask before helping your child with his. I did not need to be told that. <laughs> In fact, I'm probably going to be too busy screaming to help him at all. <laughs> this will be a good time for him to learn self-reliance. <laughs> if he can program his fucking VCR, he can goddamn jolly well learn to adjust an oxygen mask. <laughs> Fairly simple thing, just a little rubber band in the back is all it is. Not nearly as complicated as, say, for instance, a seatbelt. <laughs> the safety lecture continues. In the unlikely event of a water landing. <laughs> well, what exactly is... Am I mistaken, or does this sound somewhat similar to crashing into the ocean? <laughs> I believe what she means is, in case we crash into the ocean, your seat cushion can be used as a flotation device. But imagine that. <laughs> Just what I need. My seat cushion. To float around the North Atlantic for several days, <laughs> clinging to a pillow full of beer farts. <laughs> Flight continues. A little later on, toward the end, we hear the captain has turned on the fasten seatbelt sign. Well, who gives a shit who turned it on? What does that have to do with anything? It's on, isn't it? And who made this man a captain, might I ask? Did I sleep through some sort of an armed forces swearing-in ceremony or something? <laughs> captain, he's a fucking pilot and let him be happy with that. <laughs> if those sightseeing announcements are any mark of his intellect, he's lucky to be working at all. Tell the captain, Air Marshal Carlin says, go fuck yourself. <laughs> the next sentence I hear is full of things that piss me off. Before leaving the aircraft, Please check around your immediate seating area for any personal belongings you might have brought on board. Well, let's start with immediate seating area. Seat! It's a goddamn seat! Check around your seat for any personal belongings. Well, what other kinds of belongings are there besides personal? Public belongings? Do these people honestly think I might be traveling with this fountain I stole from the park? You might have brought on board. Well, I might have brought my arrowhead collection. I didn't, so I'm not going to look for it. I'm going to look for things I brought on board, which seem to enhance the likelihood of my finding something good. <laughs> Tell me to return my seat back and trade table to their original upright positions? Fine. Who's going to return this guy in the Grateful Dead t-shirt and the fuck you have his original upright position? <laughs> About this time, someone tells you you'll be landing shortly. I sound to you like we're going to miss the runway. Final approach is not very promising either. Final is not a good word to be using on an airplane. 
Sometimes the pilot will come and say, we'll be on the ground in 15 minutes. Well, that's a little vague, isn't it? <laughs> now we're taxiing in. She says, welcome to O'Hare International Airport. Well, how can someone who is just arriving herself possibly welcome me to a place she isn't even at yet? Doesn't this violate some fundamental law of physics? We're only on the ground for a second. She's coming on like the fucking mayor's wife. <laughs> We're at the local time. Well, of course it's the local time. What did you think we were expecting? The time on Mount Fuji? <laughs> Enjoy your stay in Chicago or wherever your final destination might be. <laughs> All destinations are final. That's what it means, destiny, final. If you haven't gotten where you're going, you aren't there yet. <laughs> the captain has asked, more shit from the bogus captain. <laughs> you know, for someone who's supposed to be flying an airplane, he's taking a mighty big interest in what I'm doing back here. <laughs> that you remain seated until he has brought the aircraft to a complete stop. Not a partial stop. So during a partial stop, I partially get up. <laughs> partially get my bags and partially leave the plane. <laughs> Please continue to observe the no smoking sign until well inside the terminal. It's physically impossible to observe the no smoking sign even if you're standing just outside the door of the airplane. Much less well inside the terminal. You can't even see the fucking planes from well inside the terminal. Which brings me to terminal. Another unfortunate word to be used in association with air travel. And they use it all over the airport, don't they? Somehow I just can't get hungry at a place called the Terminal Snack Bar. <laughs> but if you've ever eaten there, you know it is an appropriate name. It's a selfish fucking act. Suicide. Don't commit suicide unless you're really pissed off at somebody. You know, Tippy went away. That's the only euphemism we use at home. When the animals die, we say they went away. So Tippy, Tippy went away. And now uh, the, the latest news I have is Annie. Annie, my eldest, Annie isn't with us anymore either. Annie had to go away. It happens, doesn't it? Uh, it's part of the deal when you get them. Part of the deal when you get them. What happens when you get a pet? They get old. They go away. Just like your grandma. Same shit, different species. What happens to grandma? Gets old, goes away. Annie went, Annie was, Annie was a, from, from Belmore, Long Island. She came from a junkyard in Belmore. Wasn't that kind of dog, didn't have that temperament. Just a sweet big dog. She was supposed to have been a German Shepherd according to my drug-taking friend who gave her to me. <laughs> he handed me this little dog. He said, here, this is going to be a German shepherd. <laughs> and I, being a good drug-taker at the time myself, <laughs> said, well, hell yeah, you can see it, can't you? <laughs> and it never happened, you know. I used to call her my Austrian shepherd because she never quite made it to the German border. <laughs> she was a good dog, big old dog, full of love, you know, and she just got old. Just got old, hips went. First sign of trouble, just like my grandma, hips. Isn't that an odd coincidence? Same illness in the family, two different species. And he couldn't hold up them hind legs anymore. You know, you ever see that? Some of them, a lot of shepherds get that. Even well-bred shepherds will get that hip dysplasia when they get too old. Can't hold up them hind legs anymore. Just dragging them behind, you know. And then, you don't know, like, it, it, it hurts you. And, and they don't know what's going on. You don't want to do what you know you want to have to do, but you know you're going to have to do it. I knew I had to do it, and I had to do it, and I did it. I knew I had to do it, and I had to do it, and I did it. I put a contract out on Andy. Yeah, I got some people to whack my dog. But we whacked her. We 
like she was eating a big plate of food in her favorite restaurant. <laughs> like they do it in the movies. Because we knew Annie would like that. So Annie went away, just like my grandma. Actually, it's a little bit different. I believe we whacked my grandma in the mall. <laughs> but as soon as Annie was gone, we did what a lot of people did. We got a new little dog right away. Don't you do that sometimes to film a boy when a pet dies? You get a new little pet right away. We did it. We got a little guy called Mo. M-O-E, Mo. He's about this big. Mo's a Maltese. Mo's the first dog we ever had that was all one thing. You know, not mixed anything. Just got a whole bunch of Maltese in him. He's about this big. Fluffy little white little dog. And he's only got one ball. Mo only has one ball, but Mo doesn't know that. <laughs> and Mo doesn't act like it either, because Mo hugs Vern, and Vern is a cat, okay? <laughs> a male cat, too, might I add, right? So not only is this an interspecies thing, it's a homosexual affair as well. My wife and I are just praying that there be no children, because God knows what they would look like, and where would you send them to school? But I think mean, no matter where you send something like that, it's going to be ridiculed, because children are so cruel at that age. But that's what's happening in our house. These are all facts, by the way. They're growing a little bit for comedy, but these things happened at home. And little Mo humps Vern every morning. He's out there. Little Mo, he's up behind Vern about 6.30. He's got a lot of energy for a young guy. You know what I mean? He's out there trying to wear a hole in the fur on the back end of that cat and doing a goddamn good job of that I might have. He's out there humping away first thing in the morning. And he's got so much energy, sometimes his feet actually leave the ground. And he's airborne on Vern. He's trying to hold on to cat hair with dog paws and keep it in at the same time. And Vern, the cat, could care less about the whole goddamn deal. Vern is bored shitless. Vern will give you a look like this while he's getting fucked in the ass. You ever fuck somebody who's reading a comic book? Same shit. Same kind of thing. Tough on the ego, but it does happen occasionally in life. So Mo humps Vern, like I say, and it looks so cute. Look so cute. We took a picture of it and made a Christmas card out of it last year. <laughs> Swear to God, we did put just one word on it. Peace. <laughs> Peace. We spelled it correctly. We spelled it correctly. P-E-A-C-E. -E. There'll be no cheap jokes on our Christmas cards. We sent that out last year, and God, we lost a lot of friends on that. <laughs> so Mo Hunts Vern, you know, and, and Vern being a cat, like I said, we got two cats. Two cats in the house, uh, Vern and Murphy. Got them at the same time, about 15 or 16 years ago when we first moved into this house we live in now. We got them in the same week, I guess, the first week, you know. I got them from different places, they're different kind of kitty cats. And when we first got them, we had them neutered. You know neutered, that's a euphemism, but go on, cut his nuts off. <laughs> well, we had it done because somebody said it helped something. God damn sure it didn't help these cats, I'll tell you that. <laughs> we did it, we had them fixed. That's another word for it. Fix shit, they wasn't even broke, man. <laughs> they broke now. <laughs> Alter is another word. Nice people say that, don't they? We had them altered. <laughs> like a pair of pants or something, you know? <laughs> yeah, take a little off the cuffs and cut his nuts off and off. <laughs> So anyway, no matter what you want to call it, we had it done. We brought it to the vet's office and <laughs> off came the nuts. We didn't keep them or nothing like that, you know. Although the veterinarian did offer them to me, I must say that. Here, you want these? I said, no, thank you very much. I can't think of anything I might possibly want to do with four cat nuts. Why don't you hang on to them, put them in the top drawer. You'll think of something. God bless you. We won't say a word to anybody. You know, you might just make a nice pair of earrings for your wife out of them. In fact, if my math is not incorrect, you might get two pairs out of that lot. Ha, ha, ha. We had a good laugh over that, and then we got them cats off fuck away from this guy. <laughs> Brought the cats home. The cats were growing up, doing a good job of growing up, I might say, too. Get to be about six years of age, and I remind you these are facts. Get to be about six years of age, and Vern, wouldn't you know it, Vernon, the goofy one, <laughs> Vernon developed a condition whereby his penis had to be removed surgically. Not a pleasant thought! But it does happen occasionally. In fact, it happens a lot more than you might think with these male cats if you feed them only dry cat food. Not good. Got to mix in a little moist food every day because something in that dry cat food crystallizes in the urine, blocks up the urethra, blocks the whole passageway, and pretty soon you're sitting in the vet's office, and guess what? 
off comes the dick. Vern will not get in the car with me at all anymore. <laughs> trust me at all because he doesn't know what's coming up next. He's walking around counting his feet and shit like that, praying to God he's still got something left hanging off of him. <laughs> Such is the condition of the animals at our house. And because of it, we have a little riddle going around the family. What has 12 legs, two dicks, and one ball? And it's Murphy Moe and Vern. <laughs> But you gotta be kind of close to the family to guess it on the first try. <laughs> now, since you've been nice enough to listen to my pet stories, I'd like to pay you back by offering you a little household hint. And this, in fact, is tied right in because this will help you clean up after your dog. Feed your dog rubber bands. Works great. You ever try it? Feed your dog rubber bands, about 10 or 15 of them every day. Then when the dog takes a shit, there's a real good chance to be a little loop on one end of it. <laughs> huh? Is that handy? What could be handier? And sanitary, too. Just pick it up and throw it in the neighbor's yard. He'd probably think it's alien shit. <laughs> well, I like doing that, you know. Offer a little practical advice in the show. Some of you might have heard some of my more famous tips and hints from the past. How to get rid of counterfeit money. Put it in the collection plate at church. <laughs> How to get out of jury duty. A lot of people lie, don't they, try to get out of jury duty. Tell the judge the truth. Tell them you make a really good juror because you can spot guilty people just like that. <laughs> well, tonight's suggestions are a little bit different. Tonight's suggestions are things you can do to keep other people alert. Keep them on their toes during the day. People need that. So a lot of folks go through the day half asleep. I'm sure you notice it. A lot of people go through life in a fog. Need a little goose. Need a little wake-up call. Did you ever try backing out of a drive-in bank? That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Or just walk up to someone on the street and say, pardon me. I have nothing to say. <laughs> Somebody asks you what time it is, say, well... It's either 6.15 or Mickey has a heart on. <laughs> now, many of these are intended for retail clerks, by the way. Use them on retail clerks who seem to need special help. How many times you walk in a store and realize immediately the clerk was running on a lean mixture? <laughs> Cheese fell off his cracker a long time ago. <laughs> Just a couple of green stamps short of a toaster, you know. This is a good one for the gift shop. Walk right in the gift shop and ask for your gift. <laughs> I saw your sign. I came in for my gift. Save you people the trouble looking all over for me. Doesn't impress them. Keeps them on their fucking toes. Shit, they might even give a little something just to get you out of there. Here's one you might try. Go to the neighborhood photographer. Ask him, can you buy the pictures of the other people? <laughs> How much that heavy set couple in the window? <laughs> well, they will stare at you a long time on that one. In fact, they might even back up a little. <laughs> put a dry cleaner and say, ask me if they can get the stains out of one pair of pants and put them in another pair. <laughs> While you're in there, ask me if you can get pecker tracks off a wedding gown. That's good. That's a tough one for a dry cleaner. Come on, lace. Drives them crazy. Put a dry cleaner. Hand him your shirt and tell him to rotate the buttons. Go to a gun store. Buy a gun. Buy some ammunition. Ask if they have any ski masks. <laughs> supermarket, fill your cart up with a big mound of groceries, look for somebody with one item, ask them if you can get ahead of them. <laughs> Run into a bakery, ask them if they can bake a cake shaped like a penis. They don't know, they never know. They always have to have a meeting, they've got no policy on this. They get together and say, can we have a picture to go by? <laughs> no. I what I want to do, though. <laughs> Order more flour, Helen! 
Next time you go to a wishing well, ask to see the manager. Tell him to come in there for 12 years, none of your wishes come true. If you want my money back, or I'm going to shit in the well. You know, there's a lot of guys go to baseball games, have a glove with them. Fuck that. Bring a bat. If you see a foul ball coming, hit it back to them. Wave to the pitcher. They'll think you're a fun fan. They'll think it's straight jacket night. Do you ever notice in some hotels they give you a little sewing kit? You know what I do? I sew the towels together. <laughs> sew the sheets to the drapes. Let them know you've been there. Sew a button on the lampshade. <laughs> Let them figure it out. Hey, certainly none of your concern. Here's one for the guys. Go to a barber shop, tell the man you want to get your pubic hair streaked. <laughs> so nothing fancy, just frost my bush. <laughs> They'll be talking about you for years. <laughs> the man want his bush hair sectioned off with aluminum foil. Probably put you in the bush hall of fame. If they can figure out a way to slide you under a dryer. Here's a good one if you're out hitchhiking. A lot of people don't hitchhike anymore, they're afraid of being murdered. Fuck it, take a chance. <laughs> Then put your life on the line. You're out there hitchhiking. Some guy says, where are you going? He says, well, actually, I'm going back that way. You mind turning around? <laughs> Here's a good one if you're drinking in a bar. Can you notice in a bar someone always says to you, hey, can I buy you a drink? You say, no, thanks, but can I have the money instead? <laughs> Tell him you're saving up to go to rehab. <laughs> Change of subject. Change of subject. Change of subject. A lot of comedians have trouble with transition lines. Not me. I change the subject. In this case, to baseball. Baseball and football are very different. Very, very different. For instance, in baseball, well, let me start at the beginning. Baseball itself is very different from any other sport. For instance, in most sports, you score points. Or goals. Baseball, you score runs. Most sports, the ball or object is put in play by the offensive team. Baseball, the defense puts the ball in play, and only the defense is allowed to touch the ball. In fact, in baseball, if an offensive player touches the ball intentionally, he's out. Even unintentionally, sometimes, out. Most sports, the team is run by a coach. Baseball, the team is run by a manager. And only in baseball does the manager or coach wear the same clothing the players do. If you had ever seen Bill Parcells in his Giants football uniform, you would have understood the reason for this custom. <laughs> but they're very different, baseball and football. And I think they reflect something about us. They should. I mean, they're so goddamn popular. Shouldn't they tell us a little about ourselves? Reveal a little something about our values or our national character, maybe? And how those values have changed over the last 100 to 150 years. Baseball. Baseball is a 19th century pastoral game. Football is a 20th century technological struggle. Baseball is played on a diamond in a park. The baseball park. Football is played on a gridiron in a stadium sometimes called Soldier Field or War Memorial Stadium. <laughs> Baseball begins in the spring, the season of new life. Football begins in the fall when everything is dying. <laughs> in football, you wear a helmet. In baseball, you wear a cap! Football is concerned with downs. What down is it? Baseball is concerned with ups. Who's up? Are you up? I'm not up. He's up. In football, you receive a penalty. In baseball, you make an error. <laughs> Whoops. In football, the specialist comes in to kick. In baseball, the specialist comes in to relieve somebody. Football has hitting, clipping, spearing, piling on personal fouls, late hitting, and unnecessary roughness. Baseball has... 
the sacrifice. <laughs> Football is played in any kind of weather. Rain, snow, sleet, hail, fog. Can't see the game. Don't know if there is a game going on. Mud on the field. Can't read the uniforms. Can't read the yard markers. The struggle will continue. In baseball, if it rains, we don't go out to play. <laughs> Baseball has the seventh inning stretch. Football has the two minute warning. <laughs> Baseball has no time limit. We don't know when it's going to end. We might have extra innings. Football is rigidly timed and will end even if we have to go to sudden death. <laughs> In baseball, during the game, in the stands, there's kind of a picnic feeling. Emotions may run high or low, but there's not that much unpleasantness. In football, during the game, in the stands, you can be sure that at least 27 times you're perfectly capable of taking the life of a fellow human being, <laughs> preferably a stranger. And finally, the whole objectives, the objectives, I should say, of the two games are completely different. In football, the object is for the quarterback, sometimes called the field general, to be on target with his aerial assault, riddling the defense by hitting his receivers with deadly accuracy in spite of the blitz, even if he has to use the shotgun. With short bullet passes and long bombs, he marches his troops into enemy territory, balancing this aerial assault with a sustained ground attack which punches holes in the forward wall of the enemy's defensive line. In baseball... In baseball, the object is to go home <laughs> and to be safe. I hope I'll be safe at home. One short, uh, one short thing to, to, to close with, because this is part of the tradition for me too, a small excerpt from the much longer list now of forbidden words, yeah. which were, which list, by the way, uh, yeah, uh, the original list was very, uh, uh, very minor, shit, piss, fuck, cunt, cocks, like a motherfucker, and tits. The list is now 2,443 and growing all the time. This is a short excerpt. Always been interested in dirty words. Always been interested in filthy language, even, well, especially as a kid. You know, I mean, that's when you first notice them and get really interested. And, and the fascination is that you realize that you can get a grown-up's attention in a big hurry. With just a one, am I right? You drop in cocksucker at the dinner table and hey, you're going to get the potatoes, right? Probably a larger portion than you were hoping for. And then I got a little more interested in them. I was about 10 or 11 years old when I realized one day, all by myself, proud to say that, I realized we had made this language up. We humans have invented these words, you know, because you get the impression from a lot of adults when you're a kid that these words all arrived on a special train from hell, you know. They want you to feel that somehow these words are alien to our natures. No, we made them up. And then we decided not to say them. <laughs> Isn't that an interesting use of our time and intellect? Let's have some language we won't use. And thirdly, there's a little poetry in them. Just a little. It's rough, it's primitive, but it's in there. There's a kind of folk poetry, especially in the phrases that have grown out of the simpler words. And I'd like to point out a couple of the more poetic ones on this very short list for you as I get to them. This is a list about male masturbation. A very incomplete list. You'll know lots of them that aren't on this particular list, and you'll hear a few that you'll want to remember. As I say, this is um, uh, uh, a short, incomplete list. starts with the more common terms we've all heard of, jerk off, jack off, whack off, pull off, beat off, sometimes referred to as the off series. <laughs> then, then we have fist fuck. Now it's true these days fist fuck has a newer meaning, but this is well language is it flows and grows and we must we must honor how language changes. But this is the more old fashioned, more homespun meaning. Fist fuck male masturbation. Then we have wank. Wank is a British term. Perhaps you've heard it. I was having a wank and me mum come in. <laughs> well, I always like to use a new word in a sentence. Beat your meat, flog your dong, pound your pud, bleed your weed, drain the monster. 
Rather unfortunate self-image, wouldn't you say? <laughs> Crown the king. Someone who felt a little better about himself. <laughs> Stroking it. Stroking it has kind of a sporting ring to it, doesn't it? Like something one of those golfing assholes might do. After 18 rugged holes, I'll be in the clubhouse, Dan, stroking it. <laughs> Giving it a tug. That has that sort of British understatement as well, doesn't it? I'll ain't do it. Give it a tug. <laughs> no big deal. Give it a tug. <laughs> Wringing out your rope. Hold on here. Riding the great white knuckler. <laughs> now we get a little bit poetic. Hitchhiking under the big top. What you do have to picture your knees and the blanket as the circus tent with the cross the hitchhiking underneath. But I think it is a rather striking visual image. The five knuckle shuffle. Beating the bishop. I always like to include an anti-clerical remark whenever I can. Here's a better one, more specific too. Boxing the Jesuit. Probably dreamed up by a couple of happy bunkmates in a seminary in upstate New York. Now nature shows herself. Milking the lizard. Choking the chicken. Loping the mule. Waxing the dolphin. God, that's an elegant figure of speech, though, isn't it? Someone with a college education thought of that, I'll guarantee you. Waxing the dolphin. You know, as opposed to slam the ham or bop the bologna, which to me are so much more clearly junior high school work. Cuffing the carrot, whipping the wire, wrestling the eel. Wrestling the eel is interesting because it implies you might even lose. <laughs> Snapping the monkey. Nurking your throbber. Well, I had never even heard of the verb nurk prior to this interesting usage. To nurk, to have nurked, to have been nurking. I shall have been nurking, which I believe is the future perfect of nurk, by the way, in case you're ever asked on Jeopardy. Cuffing the carrot, oh, I'm sorry, snapping the monkey, nurking your throat. Oh, Jesus, am I not listening to myself? That's the problem. It's sometimes important to listen as you speak. Spank the frank, yank the plank, crank your shank, paddle the pickle, jerk the gherkin, punishing Percy. Another unfortunate thought. Visiting Rosie Palm and her five daughters. Shooting putty at the moon. Which I believe is a metaphor for man's spiritual aspiration. And finally, a term for male masturbation given to me by a member of the audience just a couple of weeks ago. Shaking hands with the unemployed. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Thanks for your support. Take care. Have a good time. Thank you very much. George Carlin, The Bitter End, Manhattan, New York, August 19, 1996.